because of what we talked about earlier. It's available all the time. It works really well. It's very efficient. It's cheap, not to us to provide taxpayers, but us as users, we pay nothing to use it. And it's very economical to put in technology all over the place. So therefore, it is often, most often, a single point of failure or single thread. And we need to be sure we protect against that, protect that valuable asset. You can see there's been international issues where North and South Korea don't get along, North Korea jamming South Korea. We have instances here in the United States where, for example, a unintentional jammer took out the Newark airport occasionally on and off again we, in the in the United Kingdom they call it the white van man this guy going back and forth on the highway in his van or for those of us that are driving around in DC with our navigation systems in our cars we're perfectly uh, un used to us driving into a garage and my navigation system says it's acquiring signals it's not because it's stupid it's because it can't get the GPS signals indoors so we know that the U.S. government has looked at the uh, critical infrastructure key resource sectors for the United States and identified 16 of those, 16 critical infrastructure key resource sectors, 15 of them use GPS for timing. And then timing is essential for most of those, and that's important. So GPS provides position, navigation, time and frequency to the, all the major modes, the aviation mode, the maritime mode, the land mobile mode, and for us here tonight, the timing and frequency mode. And, and what else could we use? We could use eLoran or enhanced LoRan, which also provides position, navigation, time and frequency to the very <laughs> same modes, but also provides a data channel and has built-in integrity. So we know, just like Sarah said earlier, that resilience is built on like a, like a cake. It's multi-layered. You need to have multiple systems all working together to give you resilience. And the U.S. is, is pretty good about that. We have a nice global system. It works very well. It's very efficient. Uh, it, and it operates 24-7 all the time all over the world. We also have other systems, local systems, autonomous systems, micro systems. We've got all those covered. Those are very, very good and there's plenty of them and actually there's more coming online all the time because of E911, E911, the drone situation, people wanting to shop in the mall and know what that that, uh, that uh, dress they're looking at, or that pair of shoes, or that uh, chainsaw, what it costs here versus something else in advertising. You can't get GPS indoors, but there are people that are dragging it indoors with other technology. There's four or five companies that are doing that. So GPS is not only an economic, economic engine for position and navigation, it's an economic engine for building other companies and businesses that use it for other purposes. The problem is we're missing this one layer. <laughs> This one layer right below GPS, but above everything else, it's this continental layer, something that's broad enough to cover all the modes in all the places and not be niche, not be for one specific mode or one specific application. And I like to call that enhanced LORAN. So I'm hoping that eLORAN will fit in somewhere between global and local as the continental solution, not just here, but in the rest of the world. So we know how GPS works, three or four satellites up in the sky that you can see with your receiver, four up, three of them plus the extra one gives you position uh, and 3D position and time. You get a couple more satellites that you can see, you start getting integrity and some other kind of, other kind of things. So what if we take that really wonderful system and we bring it down to the ground and we copy it? And that's what Loran is. Actually, the other way around, Loran was first and then GPS, but you get my point. The thing is that if you take the same kind of system and you put it on the ground, now you have something that's diverse. You have a satellite system and then you have a ground system, both working the same way and both providing the same position navigation or similar position navigation and timing capabilities. So just a really quick uh, primer on eLoran. 
it's um, a very high powered system versus GPS low powered system. It's a very low frequency system versus GPS's high frequency system. You get my drift. They're complements and they're diverse. So what affects one probably won't affect the other one. And Eloran is different than the Loran C that was built on starting, by the way, in the 1940s. Um, it is built on Loran C, but it adds capability and adds different operational techniques that makes it much, much better. The important thing is diverse, no common failure modes, but provides very similar information. The technology exists today. This isn't slideware that I'm doing. This isn't beerware, as some people would call it, vaporware in the industry, whatever. It's real technology exists not here today and in other places in the United States and the world that we're bringing back on. So you would see here a transmitting site that would have this kind of equipment on board, and you can fit it in a Connex box. And then you would have a differential uh, receiver site over on the left. We just built nine of those for the United Kingdom and install them, and they're working really fine. And then you have some control and monitor capability that you can put to kind of watch this, just like GPS has, very similarly. Now, what's important for this group is the, the transmitting site is very, very smart these days. It has lots of computers, lots of technology. It's autonomous. There are no people there. We're transmitting signals tonight from Wildwood, New Jersey that we're picking up here. There's no one on board watching it or doing anything with it. It's not necessary to have a human in the loop. We've got some really smart computers to watch this just like we have with other systems. This has a remote time scale capability. And you can read them from the top down because I think it's important that GPS is at the top. Two-way satellite time transfer, which comes out of this organization and is, is injected into the Loran station. Two-way low frequency time transfer, transferring time between two Loran stations using the ground wave signal. You can use a microwave shot, you can use dedicated fiber, you can even take a hot clock, similar to this one over here on the table. There's a cesium clock over here, which uh, Ed Powers and his team took over to the master clock, and they synchronized them and they brought it over here. You can now take that time anywhere with that cesium clock. So that's a remote time scale, but each transmitting station also has three of these clocks on board. So it's local, they're not connected up to the internet, they're not connected up to the remote time scale. They're completely independent. Now you reference those other things that are out there because you're smart, right? You pay attention to what's going on out there and you put it into your solution, but they're not directly coupled. And in fact, these stations can run for 70 to 90 days without any kind of external reference. After 90 days, you've probably got a bigger problem than whether or not you have GPS. Technology for the user, that's receivers and antennas and things. If you've got a chance to step outside, and actually somebody stepped on our cable, we know, and uh, we had a little problem, but I think we've got it back now. So we had an electronic field, electric field antenna outside. We've got a magnetic field antenna inside because we wanted to demonstrate that you can get the signal inside a building and inside structures and things like that. So this really exists. This isn't cardboard stuff. These are real pieces of equipment. Let's talk about some of the high impact sectors that you heard about already. The telecommunications network relies on GPS for timing. The energy and power systems relies, relies on GPS for timing. Banking and finance rely on GPS for timing. It's good stuff, why not use it? So we did some testing in 2011. Uh, we did some testing, actually we went overseas to get the signals and we did testing for the telecommunications industry using the National Physical Laboratory in the United Kingdom, which is a similar organization to the USNO and the NIST here in the US. It's where they keep time and test time and do things like that. They did the test for us. What the telecommunications industry has is this little mask it's called. There's a little uh, line on the chart here that says, if your solution is below this, is underneath this, it's good for telecommunications. And obviously the GPS in green was good, but you can also see that the ELRAN was good as well. Now both these technologies, the GPS receiver and the ELRAN receiver, are four years old, and both technologies have newer ones today, which would make them even better. The point is, they're both good for telecoms. 
We also did some similar tests here in the United States this time with the electrical power grid. We worked in concert with the University of Tennessee at Knoxville, which is an Oak Ridge National Laboratory Department of Ener Energy partner. And we said, hey, what do you use to time the um, smart grid? What do you use to time the power systems? What do you use to keep track of how do you tie these power systems together to make sure everything works? And they said, we use these frequency data recorders out there. Can we have a couple, please? And they lent us some. We put them in our office in Massachusetts. We transmitted from a transmitter in Wildwood, New Jersey, uh, as under, under our first cooperative research and development agreement with the Department of Homeland Security. The only thing we changed between the two frequency data recorders, the one on your right has a GPS engine in it. The one on the left, you can see we did a little transplant down at the bottom. We popped the GPS engine out. We put the Eloran engine in. That's the only change we made. And we let them run them and control them from the University of Tennessee down in Knoxville. And this is what we got. We've got uh, GPS is in black, which you can occasionally see some pieces, and Eloran is in green. So they are pretty much right on top of each other. There was just a couple of little ano anomalies here where the GPS wigged out. We don't really, we don't know why, and frankly, we don't care. Because we're not comparing GPS and Eloran to say one of these is better than the other. That's not what the point is. The point is they're complementary. When one of them wigs out, the other one's good, and vice versa. So by complementing, by being, having two diverse signals that give you equivalent solutions, you have an assured PNT. You can continue your mission. You can do what you need to do. And you have proof of position and proof of time as well. So the interesting thing is the PhDs that are down there in the laboratory, they called up the folks up in the, our lab and said, hey, this is great, we're getting super results. Can you tell us which one of these is using GPS and which one's using Eloran? They couldn't tell the difference for their equipment. That's important. So the need for time, phase, and frequency is critical. These are some of the industries that use it and the timing requirements kind of in the middle, one millisecond, one microsecond, et cetera. The timing requirements are getting tighter and tighter and tighter because telecoms wants to give you more stuff, more of the time, in more of the places. And who here doesn't consume it? If they give it to me, I'm going to view it, I'm going to text it, I'm going to do whatever with it. So they need tighter timing tolerances. In fact, since this chart was made a few years ago with 3G, it's, it's been reduced already to plus or minus 500 nanoseconds for 4G. Your new 4G phones are even tighter than they were before. So we have this cooperative research and development agreement. We call it CRADA II, or Son of CRADA, um, with the Department of Homeland Security that was signed in May. And we put signals on, on air uh, with Congressman Lobiondo, Congressman Garamendi's friend, uh, in, in June. And this is kind of what we're doing. We did some timing tests out of the station in Wildwood. We're hoping to do timing in various stations across the United States. The next one's Dana, Indiana, then Boise City, Oklahoma, and then Fallon, Nevada. Hopefully to end up in the Congressman's district with him receiving time from Congressman Lobiondo, sending it from New Jersey all the way across the United States into California. Uh, practically perfect time, the Mary Poppins time. All without the sky, all with uh, Loran. We'll also do some positioning experiments with some of the stations that are out west if we have time. And we have a deployable solution that we can use uh, that we've designed for certain customers, and we hope to do some positioning on the east coast. Oops. So tonight, if you saw, got a chance to look at the poster over here, Harris Corporation and Urson Ave in concert with DHS and the Coast Guard, we set up the experiment for tonight or a demonstration for tonight to, to show you how well the time can be and what better place to do that than the USNO. So we're transmitting from the station in Wildwood, New Jersey. We're receiving it here at the U.S. Naval Observatory, 120 miles away. We're also receiving it up in Massachusetts at one of my offices, 300 miles away, and we're receiving it at our Leesburg office as well. This is actually a very short distance for Eloran, but it's good enough for our purposes. And then you can see the antennas and the technology there. So, Doug, I don't know if you wanted me to do the demo or just take a break now for... Um, how long do how long you guys... It's only uh, probably yeah. another five minutes. Yeah, go ahead and wrap okay. it up. Okay, I'm going to turn that on. So while uh, Andre's turning the screen on here, getting it to warm up, 
going to briefly talk about, can, can everybody hear me okay? I'll be loud. So what we've got here is this is the signal being received by this antenna, this magnetic field antenna, from the transmitter in Wildwood, New Jersey, and it's synchronized using the USNO clock. What we're seeing here, the scale is plus or minus 50 nanoseconds. And what we're getting here is about plus or minus, I'm going to eyeball it and say 15 nanoseconds to UTC. Now this was just a, I call it a lab rat setup, and I don't mean any offense to the USNO because they've given us some really good equipment. I mean it for us because we've got a thing on a tripod out here, and we've got a bunch of cables laying around, and we've got to, you know this, that, and the other. And we've got a transmitter that hasn't been run for two years in Wildwood, New Jersey that we put on just a few days ago to do this. And I think these are excellent results given that, that, that it's not an operational system like the captain said they have here. This is a laboratory lab rat solution and it's still really, really good. So I wanted to point out it's, this is, these are real signals coming in and being used uh, today. And Ed, did you want to come speak to your slide? So Ed Powers from USNO also has some uh, data, and I'm going to bring that up. Completely independent of our work here. And what we try to do is anytime we, we've worked with the Moran program for decades since Closer. the beginning of Moran. Since the beginning of Moran, we've worked with the, uh, the program. And so any opportunity to have to support the Coast Guard, DHS, and the credit to support it. So we collect the data, took the opportunity for the last couple of days since they had the transport and began to actually collect data here locally, directly relative to our master clock. So this is the last 50 hours of data. We stopped it a couple of hours ago. And once again, the, uh, the RMS is a few tens of nanoseconds, scale about 60 nanoseconds over two days. So I just want to take the opportunity to show that. Excellent results. Thank you, Ed. Okay, so here is uh, what would time, phase, frequency, and data, time, phase, frequency, and data coverage look like if we were to bring up just four stations across kind of the belt of the continental United States. And that would give us something that we could use right now. So we would, uh, for example, bring up Fallon, Nevada, Boise City, Oklahoma, Dana, Indiana, and Wildwood, New Jersey. Those four stations provide this kind of coverage. Now this is only for timing, phase, frequency, and data. We couldn't use this necessarily for positioning because the geometry is not real good. And uh, unless you had a really good clock like they have here. So that's, that's kind of an example of what could be done very, very quickly with the assets that the government has available right now to use. The other thing we can do is we can inject time from the USNO or the NIST into the system any place. Here we inject it into Wildwood using a two-way satellite time transfer and then we shoot that out to Dana, Indiana over the Eloran system. So it's completely, there's no fiber, no microwave, no satellites, nothing else involved, just the Eloran itself completely independent and diverse. We shoot it on across to Boise City, Oklahoma, and for this, at this point, we end up in Fallon, and like I said, I hope we end up in the congressman's office here uh, shortly this year. But if you think about it, these are just four of the 19 stations that would be available in the continental U.S. if the, if the uh, U.S. brings Eloran back online, and you would have this kind of solution. You could have two-way low-frequency time transfer, a mesh network that includes almost 60 atomic clocks and precise time being passed around, kind of like the Internet, except without the hackability or the cyber problems that you have with the Internet, because it's all through the Eloran signal, high-power signal. So if, if one of the stations or one of the nodes was taking out, you'd still have time transferred from everywhere else. It's a very good capability for the U.S. to have. So in, uh, to wrap up, like uh, the captain said, the USNO has been involved in this kind of stuff for a long time. In fact, they were involved in timing for Loran since the, in checking timing for Loran since the 1960s through 1994. And in 1987, Congress, uh, we had a public law that says synchronize Loran C to the master clock to UTC, which was done. And then what was really prescient was 
let's make sure that GPS time and Loran time are within 30 nanoseconds of each other so that we could use them together as a complementary solution. I can have an integrated receiver that uses Loran signals and GPS signals in any combination to get a really good solution anywhere that you have both of those available. The present, we have a cooperative research and development agreement that we're using right now. One of the key features of it are industry days that we were able to, to uh, agree on to allow industry to industry not just being commercial, but government agencies and organizations. The near-term future you saw be great to bring up four stations to put time, phase, frequency all over the continental U.S. to start. Pick the continental U.S. because 98% of the population and critical infrastructure is in the continental U.S., not dissing Alaska, Hawaii, of course. The future is to, is to build the system on out and have capability right from the beginning and then move on from there. So that's it for me. Doug's giving me the hook. Any questions?